Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is March 18th, 2015, and um, we were talking about to open educators last week, and uh, we thought, you know, there's a voice we haven't heard in a while. Um, <laughs> at least we haven't. So we thought it would be great to have a, an evening to catch up with Monica Hardy. Um, and so we invited Al Elliott and um, uh, Karen Fastenpower to help do some of this inviting, and maybe Chris Sloan will be joining us here in a second. But uh, wanting to have kind of a relaxed, there he is, <laughs> wanting to have kind of a relaxed um, giving Monica lots of time to talk about what she's been up to. Um, and um, you know what? I'm not going to try to describe, but I will say a little bit, Monica, and then you fill in. I think it's been now six years since you started an experiment, uh, maybe six or seven, and you were four years in the BU house and um, working with kids in ways to open up permission and um, to them. Chris Sloan, welcome as you join us here. Hello. Um, and then I think two years ago, things changed again for you. Maybe you want to describe that a bit. And then, but you've never given up your passion, your passion to help us, help everybody, help the world <laughs> rethink um, public education. Um, that's some of the language I think you've used. Do you want to, um, let, Al, why don't you introduce yourself, and Chris, you can do that too, and then, and Karen, and then we'll, we'll turn to you. Um, okay, hi, I'm Al Elliott, fifth grade educator, um, I guess a host of the Monday's Eve discussion, um, and uh, just a, you know, a general tech head, and um, I like to hang out and talk to people about educational ideas, so that's me. Welcome. Chris Sloan. Hi. Uh, my name is Chris Sloan, and I also am a teacher of many years. And, uh, yeah, I've also been interested in Monica's kind of journey. Um, a lot of fascinating pieces to that, so I just want to learn more about how that's going or what she learned from all that her work. Hi everybody, I'm Karen. I'm here in Arizona where it's raining yet again and feeling not very much at all like a desert, but we always like that. And I'm a bit really, You guys have gotten more rain than usual? <laughs> we have gotten rain like crazy for the last, I don't know, three or four months. Wow. So it's good. Global yeah. changes of some sort. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought there. But. Oh, I was just going to say I'm a big fan of Monica's, and I'm happy that she could spend some time with us tonight. And let me just mention again that I teach at a little school in the Bronx called New Direction Secondary School and work with the New York City Writing Project. And happy. Monica, you were a host with us, oh, I don't know, I was trying to figure it out, a year, two years, something like that. Um, and it was always great to have your voice around, and um, you you know you're always welcome. So it's nice to have you here tonight. Welcome. When I, um, how would you characterize your journey um, and where you are now? Do you want to jump in sure. that way, and then we'll see where this goes? And just to iterate back to you guys how huge you have all been in this um there's a page that was resonating to a lot of us on, on our site called the It Is Me that you often think that um, people are giving up on things or not sticking with things when if the focus is that the it is you and that your job is to create the best you um, then you're not really you're sticking it out you're just morphing into different things but the other end of that is that you're never just you and that's what I want to iterate back to you guys that I just appreciate all that I've learned from you and um, appreciate the time to get back together again and perhaps it'll be more about me hearing more about what you guys are up to as well um, mm -hmm. but for those who don't know um, mm -hmm. try to do kind of a short um, history it has been I think about six years now um, and it all started um, with 
the the nagging question and pondering and wondering, um, looking across all demographics and all different ages and all kinds of people and wondering why so many people were stressed, um, and wondering, you know, with the different kinds of stress that different kinds of people had across the globe, if we could possibly whittle it down to something that would um, resonate with all of us. You know, um, there's issues that affect all of us because we're interconnected, but could there possibly be a problem that we could address in regard to this stress that would resonate with seven billion people today? And so that was kind of our focus and really did get the, um, the privilege of experimenting and prototyping ideas we had and things we learned from other people in a kind of an incubated space. Um, you mentioned the BU House. We were really in, we were in the BU House for about a year. Um, it started off the first year that we were actually doing this um, experimentation was with a pilot math class in a high school building. Um, you could look at it like a flipped classroom or Sukkot Mitra style. Um, the end of that year, um, they, kids asked permission to write their own curriculum. So then we moved into a tech building that was on the same, at the same high school, but then it involved more people in the community and more different ages. And the kids were writing their own curriculum for a year. Um, at the end of that year, they found out that that even kind of compromised the ability to, to be themselves, you know, to, to be free enough to follow their whimsy. And so they asked permission to just say they were going to be in the lab. Um, and um, at the end of that year, we felt like we'd really found one of the things that we came up with as perhaps the problem that we could all focus on, that 7 billion people could focus on, which was authenticity and being yourself. Um, but then once people were able to be themselves and find that thing that they couldn't not do, or even change their mind and find something else the next day, they were craving other people. They were craving their tribe to do that thing with, you know. Um, and um, so at the end of that year was the, the last year we were in the BU house and then we were in the city, which was the vision of the kids at the very beginning that the city would become the school, you know. And People have talked about this for, for years about, you know, the, the museums and the libraries and um, it would be like a university campus and public education would be truly public all ages, anybody in the city, and education being to draw people out, you know, to facilitate curiosities, um, to say it simply. So then at the end of that, um, taking a step, go ahead, did you want to say something, Paul? I, I just, it was a, a, a quick thought, but, but just as an example of interrupting. <laughs> That's great. So, um, I, I, I have to look the guy's name up, but he does the School Sucks podcast, and he was interviewing somebody from New Hampshire, and uh, they started questioning, like, what would happen if an adult went and said, you know what, I want to study biology. Could I come in and sit in this class um, in a high school? <laughs> but it's not exactly what you were saying. Well, that's exactly what we did. I mean, what you find mm -hmm. out is that it's not, and that got back to the beginning of our our query that it wasn't just kids or it wasn't just teachers or admin or business people or older people. Um, it was everybody that are longing to be for their curiosity to be free again like a five-year-old you know so we would have parents wanting to be a part or wishing they could change their plans you know midlife or after midlife. But anyway um, there were about four years in then, and um, kind of feeling at the point that, um, for, for me personally, that the experimenting with live people um, had found out really, I felt enough at the time um, to be pretty solid on what we came up with two, two needs that seven billion people could resonate with today. And so um, that's when I resigned from the district. Um, and so the last year and a half or so, when you put update on what I'm doing, that I think that's kind of that silent period where I've, it's more like I've withdrawn to a more um, reflective place. Because that five years was a ton of research, just 
we weren't answering to anybody, you know, so to, to gather that all in, um, reflect on it, and to continue on reading and researching, because if, if it is a systemic change that, I mean, this is just one way. You guys are all examples of another way to get closer to a better world. So if, if we're looking at a systemic way, then we really do need to look into things like history and the monetary system and the health system, you know, and, and how that all interweaves and um, look for a, syn uh, um, a solution or a modeling that has to do with the synchronicity of all those playing together. Um, because you know you try to fix one thing and it really doesn't have as much effect if, if the whole system isn't getting a do-over. So um, that brings us up kind of to the site, which I think is one thing you kind of were wondering yeah. about. Um, so yeah, I'll I, pause I, there and then we can go into that if you want. And one of the questions I had uh, as you were giving that history is when you started with you started it with students when you started organizing redesignschool.com was that from the first year or yeah so so if you want me to just dive right in that's that's the only yeah. thing I have left to really share is um, the um, this the history of the site and what the site has come to be and um, so yes in the beginning the site was created um, to kind of be a, a Wikipedia style ho bucket holder of what we came up with as an alternative because if you can't just say this is life sucks this is bad um, you've got to have an alternative right it's got to be modelable and so um, asked a bunch of experts and came up with a process of learning to learn because we feel like that's kind of what's missing we've kind of drum it out of people we feel like it's a natural process but it's drummed out by people with good intentions thinking you're going to miss something if you don't do it this way. But um, So that's where the Notice, Dream, Connect, Do came in. Um, it's along the right side of the, the site. Um, and we called it Detox from the beginning. Got a lot of flack for that. But it was a, a detoxification from this um, compulsory lifestyle. Um, Noam Chomsky, um, in his words, um, uh, manufactured consent -ism. <laughs> and so the site originated with just the four buckets because we didn't have the B yet um, but it was just where you could deposit your noticings and you could deposit your um, dreams and you could deposit your the connections you were making and you could deposit um, the, do the doings that you were doing so that it could be a resource for people that didn't know how to notice could go and see what other people were noticing or if people knew what they were interested in noticing or knew what they wanted to connect about or dream about, that's where they could actually connect with their tribes like people. So that was the original, let's make a site to do this. So it was the first iteration of the app. Um, now we're calling it an app or a chip um, that we think is part of the mechanism to make this come to be. So You're then... Uh, it, uh, what? Say that again? Yeah. So in three simple like sentences of, of what the systemic change is about. Um, first of all, it's about a problem that's deep enough to resonate with seven billion people today. You know, not three weeks down, down the road after they've had their training, but today. Um, the second thing is a, a mechanism that's simple enough um, that it's modelable, but also the tech that I think is why, you know, after 20 years within this education system, I think there is potential for a, a, a huge change. Um, so having the, the mechanism of tech and being able to model it be simple enough. And then the third thing is for it to happen in a system that's open enough that would set people free and then ongoingly keep people free. So the mechanism, part of the mechanism is an app or a chip that we've called a curiosity app. It was originally the site. Um, we're thinking now it could be a chip or a, you know, a wearable tattoo or whatever. Um, and I can get into more of that later. But one of the things that the chip would do is create a trail for each person for their entire life from the moment they start talking. Because you talk into the chip for three minutes a day. Is this the original temporary fix, you know, this detox time? Um, and you talk into it, 
about, about what matters to you. If you need a template, you can go, what I'm noticing, what I'm dreaming about, connecting. Or you can simply say what I'm curious about today. Um, and then it connects you to other people in your town that day. Um, just to see if there's a connection and if you want it to, to continue. Um, so the site now is a reflection of someone's brain. And because I've invested a lot of, you know, I've learned all this stuff from people and people have contributed, but I've pretty much been the translator into the site. And I say that because it's pretty quirky, so I have to own that quirkiness. But it, it's an example of one flavor of what the app could create for 7 billion people so that we no longer have to do credentialing, we no longer have to do um, resumes or grades or weekly weekly or yearly or whatever. Um, we each have this commonplace book. Stephen Johnson talks about in How We Got to Now, a commonplace book. Um, it's just a journal of all the things you've thought about and you know all your thoughts and everything. So it, it, it's an example so, now of, of my brain or whatever what, that could be created from this app. And um, Karen's running this site. Um, if, if we wanted to find app chip, we would search for that? And so page so on that. that's yeah. one of the things that Paul had asked that maybe we went through. I do need to preface this. With, it doesn't matter if you like the site or get the site. It's just an extension of my brain, and people that would maybe be curious about me or the stuff that we've done might want to look at it. So that, that's why I'm sharing it. It's not any ticket or golden answer or anything. <laughs> so it was created by a lot of people and first thing that we came across is there were so many people involved there was no way to just say it's this person or it's ten people. Um, and so we thought with adding so much it did, did need to be Wikipedia style. It, we, there's no pages on uh, there's no posts on the site that would come up in an RSS feed. They're all pages. Um, so that you go to the site, hopefully the essence is up front, a story about people grokking what matters, be you, a quiet revolution. Um, and then the rest of it is per your curiosity, because we're trying to model the whole thing. Um, and so, but there is some organization behind it. So if you, most of the graphics, you, if you click on them, you can find out more about it. Like if you click on redefine, we talk more about what that means to us in this whole process. Um, you click on ed educate, public or education, same thing. Um, if you click on a story, it, over the years we've had so many people say, "Well, what are you doing? What you know? What's your pitch?" You know. So, and some people want a really short pitch. Want, some people want a long pitch. So when you click on a story, the drop down, um, you can have a short version, a long version. Um, I'm not seeing it all the time, so I don't know if you're at the same place as me. Yep. Yeah, Karen's doing a great job of following. Okay, so you guys can see it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so when you actually click on the story, you get those three different l lengths. And then underneath it, books-ish, are four or five different books that we've written. I mean, the two needs we think we have are authenticity, people being themselves, and attachment, being known by someone. So the first two books were Be You, the authenticity, and Be Us, the attachment. Um, then it goes to the next book is um, A People Experiment, which is the actual, the next step that we want to take to experiment with it, with a large group of people and, and having that mechanism in place. Um, and then the last book on there is um, one that I've recently put out is um, another way. So it's just a like a kid's book because this has to be simple enough that nobody even has to read a book for it. But if they did, it needs to be as simple as a kid's book. The next um, topic across there or heading is about. So um, the thing under there probably that people would be interested in is the storyboard and it has um, the, the, the different years, by year, what we learned. Um, we've got a lot of documentation on YouTube, and um, so that's there. People, again, I said there's so many people that we started off this grid, and we thought it was really cool that um, 
Blogger lets you go over to Blogger and then it, it showed the grid, but it also let you separate them by, you know, global mentors that maybe we've never even met, but they've been mentors to us um, hugely by what we've learned from them. Local mentors, um, local people that were working on the lab, I mean, global people. Um, and the next one over, um, is that all that was under? Yeah. Grokking. Mm -hmm. Grokking means to know something so well that you become it. And so we thought that was a fitting word. And also under that, we thought we put frequently asked questions because then the more you ask, the more you, you grok it. Um, plus, with the, when you click on grokking, it's a glossary. So now back to Paul's original question about looking for app chip. You could go to grokking, go to A, look for app slash chip. If you know the phrase you're looking for, that's the best place to go to that glossary. You can also go down under we are making this for you slash us and there's a search and you could put app chip in there the only problem is then it brings up anything that has that in it so you might have to scroll down and then when you find it you'd have to click on the title to actually open that page Very cool. um, under so what map the rest is I think explanatory on the right is detox um, the, the parts of detox down below, there's um, uh, 12 grids of people, and that's when we were practicing, you know, way back when, when we were practicing the detox with the kids. So each one of those is a kid going through detox on something, and then under all of those, there's a grid that says detox remix, and Jim Folkstead, the CSU professor that worked with us on this, he put all those videos together for a detox video. Wow. So uh, that's a good introduction, would you say? Anything else you would add to introduce the site? No? I uh, guess just yeah. one more, just to uh -huh. again uh -huh. say there's nothing special about it. Um, but that's the point of the future that we see, is that it is my extended brain, like Jerry, if you know Jerry Mikulski, his brain, that now when I have so much that I'm thinking about, well for one I can just be thinking about and doing the things that matter to me rather than trying to document everything um, in the future. But also then when I'm talking with people, it's like I can look stuff up if I can't remember stuff. Or you can look stuff up, like if we're talking and I say really weird, you know, phrases, you can look them up later if you're interested. It's just trying to model that by interestness. Mm -hmm. All right, Chris, Al, Karen, any, um, do you want to jump in here with thoughts? Al, I don't know how familiar you were with all this. But, uh, I actually went on the site earlier today, <clears throat> and when I was checking it out, like one of the things that I really appreciate about the site are the definitions of what it is. Like uh, a lot of times, you know, like when I first got to the site, I, I didn't know exactly what it was, but as I was clicking on the things, I kind of, it doesn't self-guide you through but it's so simple to that when you see it you know what you're looking at you know what I mean like it's very easily digestible let me say it that way because I didn't have these instructions but exactly as you were when you were talking about it, it was kind of oh yeah it is set up like that so it was set up like it was it was kind of it wasn't familiar um, but I like the way you kind of just made everything simple and defined um, I think it's an excellent reference I, I would love to be able to and so you're saying that you made this site but I'm curious to know so um, how do I use this? Do I just use this as more of a reference? Like, or, because cause that's what it kind of feels like. It feels like I can go in here and kind of see some stories and figure out where I am and what I could apply to what I'm trying to do. It's kind of what the site was feeling like. Right. Was a, good, a good feel. <laughs> Which it can be used for that, but that's limiting to your capabilities, right? I okay. mean, because it's not like Wikipedia where thousands of people are working on it. What it is, is it's a model of, our, our desire is to experiment with a, a, a large group of people, a thousand or more, so that we can model this different lifestyle, completely different lifestyle, perhaps without money, perhaps without political system. Um, and then once we do that, if it works, we envision this going global. So once it goes global and everyone has this device, um, it could be a, your cell phone. It could be your laptop, 
or it could be a chip. That's kind of what I'm leaning toward, is a chip that could be attached to a necklace. It could be attached to um, whatever. But the only, if we have to call it a curriculum or whatever, would be that, well, one of the thing, two things is that you talk to yourself for three minutes a day. So that three minutes of talking becomes the data that matters to all of us. Um, and it, it becomes what fills up your site like this. So ideally, everyone would have a site like this. It wouldn't necessarily be a site. If you go to um, Jerry's Brain, if you either Google it or go on the search on, on this Redefined School site, Jerry's Brain, he's been working on um, a much more sophisticated looking um, nonlinear mapping for 17 years now um, of putting all his findings together. And it's a more tech looking where you, you know, it's a networked grid. And so you can click on one thing and it just opens up to all the other things that are connected. So those are two, di two versions of what your your um, extended brain or whatever you want to call it would look like in the future. So this isn't this is just showing you what someone's brain could look like in the future. If it's helpful to you, great. If not, the purpose of it is for for mainly for the person to um, have a common place book of all their thinkings. Another thing that the app does though is that it uses that three minutes a day talking and connects you to somebody in your locality to shorten the time between your intention and your action every day. Um, so this is just one thing that the the mechanism, the tool, the chip, the app would create for every person. So it's so just, creating a nonlinear portfolio for you in, in words that maybe we're more used to. Just in case we don't get back to this, um, but so I'll j jump in. I mean, there's a lot of concern these days, you know, from the White House to you know to a lot of other people, um, who about data and controlling data. So, you know, walking around with a chip, <laughs> keeping track of everything I do feels a little scary at this at this point too. You know what I mean? So, how um, do you, have you thought about that aspect? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there's several different things, but I'll start with. This is modeling a completely different way to live. And so a lot of the technologies um, that are man-made, um, like money, like privacy, like encryption, like the political system, won't be pushed out necessarily, but they'll become irrelevant if this all comes to pass. And so one of the ways that privacy and worries about that will become irrelevant I'll flag um, Neil Gershenfeld on this one because he's really, um, to me, really nails it. If you're not familiar with him, um, there's a good TED on him or you can look him up in the site. See, that's another thing that you can Google him for sure, but if you want to know what I was talking about with in regard to him, now you could look at his page. So his big thing is um, working at MIT and offering a class that was a class that you could make whatever you wanted. Um, he didn't think it would be that huge of a um, interest to people, but it was. It was huge. But the kids couldn't believe that they could really make whatever they wanted. After the findings, after you know they got into it. Monica, he, what's the name again? His name is Neil Gershenfeld. Okay. G E R S H E N F E L D. Okay. Go ahead. And I'm gonna since you stopped me, I'm gonna shorten this up because there's so many other details. Okay. But because he's so smart and works in tech, he was asked by the military, so what can we do to have a safer military? I mean, I'm using my words, not his words. His are much smarter. Um, and his response was that there really isn't anything. The best thing that we can do is provide some for everybody something else to do. In other words, all the people that are inspecting the inspectors are deciding they're going to be evil or whatever, what if we offered everybody, 7 billion people, something else to do, the thing that they can't not do, which I think is the, the changing thing that tech provides today. Um, and so if there's that in place, if there's um, 
that everybody else is doing their own thing and they don't have as much time to maybe troll around your site. I mean, most of the people that we've then looked into, because that was an issue, when you get down to the, the, the story under the story under the story under the story, if they would have only had the luxury, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Neil Gaiman talk about, that the reason they're so successful is that they had the luxury to do whatever they wanted. Um, so privacy becomes less an issue if there's less people inspecting number one. The other thing is the only requirement with the chip or the app or whatever is that it's on for three minutes a day. So you don't have to have any connection to technology for 23 hours and 57 minutes a day. Um, so it's not, that's not a requirement to be plugged into something all the time. The three minutes is just for you to talk about what you're curious about so that we can gather data and see if maybe there's somebody local that you would like to connect with. Oh, I had a question about, you know, the connectivity stuff. Um, so, Monica, you were talking about, um, I mean, it sounds really cool to me, like um, when the community was your school. Um, so I'm thinking that, um, like, your idea for the chip app, um, I'm guessing kind of came from some of your experiences at that time, and um, and I was just wondering. I'd like to know a little bit how that went or how that looked, um, successes and failures, because um, I'd imagine it's a pretty, yeah, you know, it's a different idea, and so I would imagine some of it worked wonderfully, and then some of it maybe didn't work great. I don't know. Absolutely. In fact, I'm glad you phrased it that way because um, one of the pages on the site and one of the we also have slide shares, um, and one of the ones that I thought was most important, um, titled "Findings and Failings," it's like the least looked at, and it's like, well, that's where that's where you should go first, you know, is what didn't work, so that oh, cool, so we'll try it this way, you know. Um, so, just iterations of the app. Now, the first being, and I'll miss some because there's it's just. 24-7 iterating, right, and a whole bunch of different people. So the site, and just thinking, okay, what if we bucketed the noticings, the connectings, you know, and then people could find people that way, and they could also learn how to do it that way. Next, we had a Google Doc that we were, you know, kids were either just emailing to us or um, had a blog or just wrote in the Google Doc their noticings, streamings, connectings, and um then we had, in, when we were in the BU house, we had a closet that we had a laptop in there and um, had along on the wall prompts of what are you noticing, what are you dreaming about. Um, and, and with some really sophisticated people beyond me um, looking at how at that point could we take those videos and do word recognition um, and connect people that way. Um, the next step that um, that I, in particular, spent quite a while with, and it came from Alex Alexander Hayes, um, was wearing a necklace. I mean, we had a long Skype talk about the next phase of this, and um, he said what I sh should probably do is get some kind of a device that I picked, you know, whether it's a watch or a necklace or carrying a phone that I picked that I would be the most comfortable with, and he's big on the Google Glass, you know, and then have it be non-functional. And I was like, you know, hey, Alex, we're trying to save the world here. I can't wear a non-functional thing for a while, you know. But that was huge to, to all of this because in his, not his words, but his thinking, um, if something is non-functional, like when you get an iPhone, it's already decided the capabilities it has, you know. But when you have something non-functional, then you're really free to decide. And now we're getting back to Neil Gershenfeld and his phrase of personal fabrication. Um, the ability for now 7 billion people to truly create whatever they want every day. So that got me thinking about people would want different versions of this. Um, you know, I have a mom who will probably never do anything beyond maybe typing into a huge computer if she had to do something tech. She'd probably rather a person was there recording her, you know. All the way to somebody like, you know, 
that doesn't even want to have to carry anything. And so they want it to be a tattoo or they want it to be a necklace is what I picked. So I, for over a year I wore, well for over a year I did the talking into the laptop thing to experiment myself. And now I'm going to speak from personal experience because I think that's a little more clear. And then for probably another year or more I wore the pendant. Um, so then I got to think every day about what I wish it could do, you know, um, if I were able to tweak with the code. Um, and from all those failings and trials and everything, came up with the idea that we would probably want to develop for this model group, modeling group, a chip or whatever that was really cheap but only had um, those three or two basic functions of taking the data in from the person, actually three functions, taking the data in from the person, connecting them to someone locally, and then creating a trail of what they're thinking about every day and um, who they're connecting with and what they've been doing. So then people could take that chip, it would be a morphable chip for whatever it is. So you could then add on to it the things you thought about that you wished it could do. Does that answer your question at all, or at least a little? Yeah, the app part of it. Um, I was just wondering, as you reflect back on the, the actual, before even the website, or, or maybe not before the website, but before the app, like actually connecting with people on just like people-to-people -people level in the community, like in the library, you know, intergenerational kind of, okay. kind of story. Okay, so like what we did? Yeah, um, actually like how it would look to someone okay. um, just on the street, you know. Well, this is, I'll tell you what, what we've done so far and how it looked, and then I'll tell you the vision that we have of how it would actually work out now with the chip and stuff. So when we were in town, um, connections to people who know knew quite a few people in the town. Um, Barry Floyd is, is the, the main person that we connected with, just a, um, a person who grew up here or spent quite a lot of time here and um, was knowledgeable about the people, connected to the people. So he would come to the BU house and the kids would talk with him about what they were interested in and within a few minutes he could have them downtown with his friend who's the great art person or whatever. So that was one luxury we had of actually seeing how conversation could turn into a connection if people had time to know each other, know you know who's in your block and what, and what they do. Um, we also had uh, at a coffee house downtown we had um, an iteration of the app was on one side of the, the door of the coffee house we had a, a, a big board for, that said um, curiosities um, shared daily and then another um, board that said fears erased daily or I don't even remember exactly what they said but people would write curiosities on the chalkboard anonymously and then we would bring those curiosities inside on a grid inside the coffee house just to show people that there were other people that might be interested in building a tree house or might be interested in graphic design. Um, um, we also, when we were in the VU house, in the kitchen, the whole wall was dry erase, a dry erase wall, and we had a big grid that worked like a Google Doc that people could say, you know, what they were interested in and what they wanted to do and when they were going to do it. Um, so, in the future, with hopefully something, to me, what tech can do is can organize our chaos can do better than what we can do manually, not to get rid of the face-to-face, -face, but to free us up to more of the face-to-face. -face. So a scenario that's in that latest book, Another Way book, um, is so every day by 9 o'clock you have to have talked in, if you're going to play this game with us and you get a year off, you know, because we think it'll take six months to a year to model it enough for people to believe that we could live without all these things we think we have to have. And your experimental group is a thousand people. Well, two. that we at least a thousand, and I can go into why picking a thousand. Um, but yeah, it, a, a big group, and it can't just be a group of high school kids, or it's got to be an eclectic group of all ages, all kinds of people. Um, 
So mm -hmm. the rule, if you're going to play this game with us, is that by 9 o'clock every day, you have to have talked into this device for three minutes. Um, by 11 o'clock, at 11 o'clock every day, your local time, everybody's going to meet up with a suggested meetup person. So you're all, we're all, you know, maybe downtown or wherever, the library's opened up, the community center's opened up, whatever, and, you know, by GPS, the tech is leading you to this other person, or it sent you a text message, whatever you preferred um, to, to meet up with this other person. And so we're all in this public safe space, everyone's around, and we're just meeting up for a conversation to see if, oh, did I mean the same China as you? Did I? Did you mean China the plate? Because I meant China the country. You know, just to clarify if we want to further that. The only other requirement is that you meet up with a family type group. It could be biological or not for 30 minutes a day. Um, so then you have another 30 minutes that your maybe your group has decided to meet in the library or in the coffee shop or in maybe now you have a recording studio because. Now all the finances that went into public education are going to build up these spaces in the city. Um, and then the rest of the 23 hours a day, these spaces that we've created, because we've decided the city is the school, you get to do whatever you want in all of those spaces. You get to facilitate your own curiosity and whimsy. The family group is... Um, the same people each day and it's yeah. not by interest, is that right? Right. It could start out randomly. Like we divided up in our district at the time and it was about if we just used employees of the district, public education employees and youth in the district, this is not even going into other community members, it was about a one to eight ratio. And we thought seven or eight is a pretty good number. So initially it's just a random grouping. Now if you ended up finding your tribe for week after week and you, you knew this was your tribe, it could switch to that. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of that group is so that everyone's known by someone. There's no agenda when you meet for that 30 minutes. You could just sit there and look at each other, sit there and not look at each other. You can do whatever. But that's just catching people who might not have a home situation and may, might fall through the cracks of not being known by someone. Okay, so I, I had a question about the, the thousand number, uh, just like geographically, like where would they need to, would they need to be relatively near, like you're saying the same, did you said it be a thousand, like okay, I'm in Birmingham, if I wanted to try to play this game, I would need a thousand people in this area, is that, is that what, how it works? Yeah, I mean that's the tricky part, we've, and again this last year and a half is getting prepared to go anywhere, because um, the other, the other thing that we found is it's it's hard to to completely change a system, right? Yeah. And to convince enough people at the same time to play this for six months to a year, to take the risk all at the same time. So one of the things we're looking for is twenty million dollars, no strings attached funding. That um, like eight million of it would go towards paying people. Like it could be teachers that take a year off sabbatical. It could be parents that their job lets them take a year off, whatever. It could be kids that have started this whole project with us and want to come back and need some a little bit of money for living, whatever. Seven, about seven million is to purchase spaces. So that, because what we experienced, now back to Chris's asking about failings, is if you go through city policy, um, not even school district policy, but city policy to change buildings, you know, we spent the first year walking up and down the street, the downtown street, and looking at all the empty spaces and saying, this could be a this, and this could be a this. And another thing you might be interesting is um, if you look at City SketchUp, um, Christian's done a, a SketchUp of all the dreams that we had as we walked the street of this could be this, could this could be this. So about $7 million so that we could at least have community-owned spaces that we wouldn't have to wait for permission to check, kind of like pop-up spaces. It could be a recording studio. And then in a month, if enough of us decide, it could then be, you know, something completely different. Um, and then about $5 million, because the key, key to all this is the tech organizing the chaos. And so about $5 million is to, to make sure that there's enough broadband, Wi-Fi, and that everyone has the device that we have some experts that help write the code to get it going. Um, and so, so 
of the places we have listed, again, we're, we would be happy to do this anywhere. We just want to see it done. We'd be happy if, through what you guys are doing the Student Voices, made a global change happen. It's just we want equity to happen. Um, one of the places that would be ideal would be Loveland, Colorado, because that's where a lot of this happened, like the city sketchup that Christian had. There are actual places, and there's actual people that we said, this person's an expert in food, this person's an expert in homelessness, this person, you know, that would oversee those things. Um, but another place is that the thousand came from is in um, a town about um, 40 minutes away where there's a thousand people. It's a town within a town. It was created as a template to show the city of the future, kind of, where the streets are walkable, um, kind of a Jane Jacobs kind of style place. And a thousand people live there. That's where the thousand came from. But mm. it's compacted. It's like a little city, you know. So like Birmingham would be like Loveland. You would just need a, enough of a bulk of people eclectic enough people within that city to be doing right. I got but it'd be great if we did if we I mean honestly I feel like we've worked on this enough that it could be the whole city I mean technology can handle that if it's if the whole city <clears throat> is brave enough to do this you know um, actually like, uh, like, like last summer like that was my summer project for this nonprofit here at Birmingham is how to set up your own Wi-Fi network and so I kind of went and mapped out where you would, you know, put up the post. I called, I guess it's the Red Hood Project in New York, and talked with them about how they actually set it up. So, like, as you're talking and saying the things that you would need to set it up, I'm thinking, you know, yeah. But anyway, yeah, definitely. I, I, I'm, I more clearly see how what you're talking about can come to fruition. So this is extremely beneficial. So behind all that is you, you really can't get – people to believe that a free and democratic and just society can happen unless you show it, unless you model it, you know, like wow. walking. And so that's the whole kicker of this is we can't come up with a pamphlet or a site or anything that would convince people. We have to actually do it with enough people so that after six months or a year's time, people start going, dang, that's, that is possible. And look at how that, that group of people are way more healthy. Crime has gone down. Suicide rate has gone down. I mean, those are some of the, the measurements that we would have as opposed to, I mean, one of the forbidden things would be to talk about did your um, grades go up? You know, did your, the math scores rise? I mean, that's... So I put in there um, Coaster Grammatis. Um, he started a human right. Um, so Al, kind of back to your Wi-Fi stuff. Um, and he also recently started another company called All of Us. I think it's O L O V U S. But if you look up Costa on the site, it'll be there. That would be a, a great person to connect with. Um, also, yeah, there's just a lot of people that are working on those mesh networks so that you are self-sufficient in your right. Wi-Fi as well. There's also some cities that are starting to go, you know, full city Wi-Fi, which this prospect is this thousand city and it's within one of those cities that is supposedly next year going full Wi-Fi. Yeah, and just quick mention that um, some states driven by corporate interests are enacting legislation to prevent municipal Wi-Fi. So I'm, I'm often tweeting out petitions <laughs> to sign about that. So I'm curious, Monica, uh, beyond the pilot, how important is the the city piece of this in the physical locality and and could it you know could this all be virtual and be the systemic thing you're envisioning absolutely um, so back now to a personal why I came into this um, I connected with this guy in Belgium and we skyped for like six months just forever and after that, and he, I got introduced to Sukata Mitra and that whole thinking. I came back to this and got the permission to do this pilot math class. And at that point, I thought, we can do this. We can do this all virtual. They all got virtual mentors, um, most of them out of Seth Godin's online tribe. Um, and but that, but what we found is 
ideal is face to face. You know, if it's possible, if it's any way possible to do face to face, that is your first, you know, calling. Um, but that doesn't mean that remote places that don't have enough people for everyone to find their tribe, it doesn't mean that that's not possible. It's just not, an, it, it'll be an ideal situation for them, but it's not ideal. So yeah, absolutely. That's where it started and that's where one of my findings and failings was. But you can't just do it all virtual. But you, it, it, the other side is that you can. It's fascinating stuff. Can, can you talk a little more about why you've moved off um, working with kids right now? We're working with young people or people in general right now. One of the places I can pinpoint it to is I listened to um, a panel, I think it was at Harvard, and Jane Costello was talking. So you can put her in there. Jane, I think it's C O S T E L L O. And at the end of the talk, um, somebody asked her, she's done amazing work with indigenous people and. Um, one in particular, I think that it was like a mincom, um, basic income type thing where they just went in and gave money. I mean, there's so many things out there that we, at least I have been told, if they're not possible, that couldn't happen, that they've actually happened, and we just haven't recorded them or we haven't made them public knowledge, you know. So that was one of the things she was sharing. At the end in the Q&A, somebody asked her about the diagnosis, the diagnoses that she'd been making about mentally ill people or whatever. Her comment really resonated with me. Her, her, her response was that she thinks it's almost unethical to make a diagnosis about a person if you don't have a mechanism in place to take care of that diagnosis. Is that, let me let that mm -hmm. settle with you before I go on from there. So if I'm going to say, if I'm going to give you a test and say you are this, you have this problem, but there's no thing to take care of that problem. It's, she was saying it's almost unethical. It's like you're saying, you have that, but there's nothing to fix it. That made me think that we really had the luxury and the privilege to experiment with live people, and I felt like got all the answers we needed. Beyond that point, it seemed unethical to keep experimenting. Um, when you could see how hard it was since the group was wasn't huge enough for everyone to have their own tribe and that gets lonely um, so that was the main thing um, the other thing is it getting too uncomfortable for the system I mean from the beginning we called ourselves after Saul Kaplan's words a connected adjacency you know working a lot out a sandbox outside of the system and working back and forth I mean I, I still see it that way but I think it was getting too uncomfortable for them, and it was feeling, even though I'm sure people think, how ridiculous could you possibly be, it was feeling too restrictive for me. Um, to say that we need 100% freedom, but I didn't feel it, I, I felt co convicted to model everything we've talked about and practice it myself, just to see for myself. And so, those were a couple of the reasons. And just to say, your district did take the work, and um, it's continuing on a site. Do you want to mention what that site is? And it's connected to your site. But. Yeah, e e3learning.co. Um, so when I resigned, I hired um, a couple of brilliant ladies to um, carry on, or actually start again, or whatever. Um, but provide an option for kids in the district um, that either are full-time homeschooled or part-time homeschooled, you know, full-time in the district but just wanted to take a class like, you know, an independent study type class. Um, and the last time I talked to them, they had over 30 kids now. Um, so what they're doing is, an, what, what you asked about before, Chris, is the kids come in, they're in, a, in an alternative high school building. Um, and in order to get, well, I won't go into that, but um, I can if you want the, the funding and stuff. Um, but the kids go in there and talk about what their interests are, and then um, the facilitators find local people to be their mentors. 
Cool. That's cool. Um, I had a question about, um, you know, through the years, Monica, we had some of your students on. You know, like you've mentioned Christian, but I remember there was another guy, really eloquent, uh, articulate guy. I think he had curly hair, and there was a girl who was doing amazing things. Like, do you, what ever happened to them? Well, um, so some of them... I, I love that you have a visual image of them. <laughs> <laughs> some of them, um, like, are beyond high school now. So, you know, in college or not, um, one of those, the curly-haired guy, I'm guessing you're talking about Peter, mm -hmm. um, still connected with them and talking about this, but again, there's no mechanism in place, so they need to carry on. Um, that is part of the dream, is that if we get the funding, when we get the funding, um, that some of the people, if they need to be paid, or if maybe they just need a place to live, to carry this out for a year and experiment with it, very much still on a lot of their minds. Um, Sierra was the girl. Sierra and a couple of others that were part of the, the last couple of years of the lab um, are part of this E3 learning um, and doing amazing things with that. Um, We only have a few minutes left. I, I want to jump in with, uh, you mentioned at the beginning um, and uh, that you've been reading Noam Chomsky and Manufacturing Consent, and um, the kids I work with every day um, are coming, a conversation that you and I have had over the years is that they're coming they're not blank slates when they're coming, right? So, like, three minutes of saying what's on your mind <laughs> doesn't, you know, I mean, I guess I guess I, I, I struggle with, I, I totally believe that finding your inner voice and following your inner voice is, is vital, right? But I think it's really, really hard to get there. And so I just wondered what you thought about that. Well, again, back to Chris's question about failings. Um, mm -hmm. We were able to experiment with letting kids do just that. Um, the three minutes, by the way, is a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, I think when people have time and space, they'll spend a lot more time. But in order to collect the data to do what the app needs to do, the three minutes is a minimum. Um, what we found is if people around you are doing amazing, interesting things, um, if you don't have something that you're dying to do and the resources and the mentor, local mentor to help you to actually do that and the tribe to do that with, you are sitting around exposed to people doing brilliant, amazing things and looking like they're really enjoying themselves. Um, and so it's not like, you, you know, you're going to talk for three minutes and then you're going to spend seven minutes, seven hours in a job or at school with other people expecting you to do things or telling you what to do. You're exposed um, to all these other people that are that are doing things. So again, it's it's hard to expl explain it's something that needs to be done in order for people to see the dance, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, yeah. But those are a lot of the things that we experimented with and and tried to figure out, you know, why why is it that it takes so long to detox. You know, could we hasten detox, um, and how would that look? So I shared my one burning question. Do the three of you, <laughs> Al, Chris, and Karen, have a burning question to finish off here tonight. No pressure, but any thoughts? To uh, well, I don't really have a question or comment, but uh, I just really appreciate hearing you explain, you know, like what the, the, the process. Uh, like, I guess just to kind of put a pin in the three minutes and the whole connect uh, point of view, just sitting here this hour listening to you, everything that I thought about what you were talking about has kind of changed, but I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more clear, which is, I guess, I guess kind of the point, like for people that don't know what they want to be when they grow up yet, to be around people that still haven't figured it out but are having fun along the way, it kind of encourages them to not necessarily wait for that moment to decide 
hey, here's what I want to start looking up or being interested in. It kind of helps to uh, peak, I guess, that natural curiosity that isn't fostered. So, I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't have a burning question, but I'm glad I was on the Hangout. Yeah, it all depends on the assumption that what's lacking in the world, this is a Howard Zinn quote, my paraphrase, what's lacking in the world is the energy from people that are not awake or not, you know, fully alive or whatever. And if we believe that, and, and another assumption that curiosity is a means to that, um, then how do we make sure, it's not like we have to learn curiosity, it's how do we not get it out of people, drum it out of people right. you know, by certain things. And then the people who have to relearn it, how do we do that as well? Mm -hmm. And I actually had a question. Um, you mentioned earlier a CSU researcher who was working with you. Um, who is that, and do they have they published anything? Or um, his name is Jim Folkstead, um, and he's a professor there. And um, there was a a student of his that then became um, I don't I don't know all the titles of everybody, but um, Adam Ma Mackey also worked with us from CSU. Um, we did all the legal things to research with kids, um, thinking that we would write stuff up. Um, but there's, he hasn't written anything up that's specific to this. I mean, other than blog posts. Um, and I guess, I mean, it's not going to be an answer that people like, but it's another, we're trying to model a different way of life. And the whole peer review and CV and all this stuff, we're trying to keep as much away from that so that if other people want to try to do this, they don't feel like they have to do that as well, you know. Um, and I understand the whole, maybe that's how people understand things, but 95% of the people, 99% of the people that we want to be able to have a different life aren't going to read those things, you know. They aren't going to be the ones to do it. So that wasn't our focus, I guess. Um, Karen? I have a hundred burning questions, but it would probably take the rest of the night to get through any of them. So mm -hmm. I'll d I just say that it makes me more hopeful about the world that people like Monica are thinking about something completely different and a completely different way to do things. Okay. And I'll balance that out with another reason I was able to resign is knowing people like you that are continuing on doing just amazing, amazing things within the system. I mean, we need all of it, right? We don't, none of us know which of those things is going to happen the quickest. We're all craving that. But, um, so, you know, I just appreciate all the people like you guys that are just doing amazing things um, within the system. Well, thank you for tonight. Um, I, I hope we're part of your tribe. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so and and um, yeah, so we seek each other out that way too, and and we'll seek you out more often. Um, so thank you for such a detailed explanation tonight, Monica, and um, just thank you. <laughs> the um, we will be back here next week, and uh, um, we are here every Wednesday at um, edtechtalk.com slash ttt and we are um, we broadcast over the um, Ed Tech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier set that up several years ago. Thank you all and um, good night. Good night. Thanks good night. everybody. <laughs> <laughs>